If your church has been around long enough, they've probably got one of these hanging on their wall somewhere. It's a painting of a shepherd and a sheep. Well, lots of sheep. Uh, beautiful green pastures, still waters. It's quiet, it's peaceful. It, it's all of that. But have you ever tried to steer a sheep? All right, time for dinner. Come back, no, it's okay. You guys, wait, we're friends. Why do you run? Hey, don't get smart out with me, all right? All right, someone's getting the shears. And if I'm to be honest, sheep, they're dumb. I don't know if you've heard, no, they're just not as smart as other animals. No, they're dumb. Like walk off a cliff just because it's there, dumb. All right, do you want me to take you out to pasture? Because I will take you out to pasture. No, no, come back. Karen, no, Karen, over here, over here. Goodness gracious, they're just stubborn. Skittish, too. Fearful little things. Oh, don't be like that. Do you want me to get the shepherd's hook? Do you want me to get the shepherd's hook? Hey, hey, I'm the one that feeds you. Hey, don't ignore me. I think I get kids ministry now. Fine. I love you. You ever wondered why Jesus called us a sheep? Kind of a bitter pill to swallow, huh? But if we were to closely examine our lives, look at all the messes that we make, how fearful we are, how fickle and wayward we can, well, if I can just put it bluntly, how dumb we can be, we are sheep. Yeah, sheep, that's about right. <laughs> but thankfully, God sent us a good shepherd, someone who will be gentle with us when we are far from home, someone who will be firm when he needs to be. Doesn't it say everything that God picked shepherds to send the good news of Jesus' birth and that right there should remind us of his shepherd in ways right off the bat. That first Christmas, it was a sign of peace with God for all eternity. And our shepherd, he paid the price for that peace, the highest price. I don't know about you, but this Christmas, it means so much to me that I have a good shepherd. scripture reading, but because uh, I was just sitting there thinking, I wonder if I should tell this story or not. So I'm going to I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> so uh, some of you know that our daughter Hillary got married in July to a wonderful godly man. And in August, we got a phone call saying that uh, after a lot of prayer, Brandon, who is in the military and special forces, has really uh, felt called by God to go to the Ukraine. And uh, after that conversation, I have to admit, I spent about 24 hours absolutely reeling, thinking, what the heck? It's going to actual war zone, and I know he's been deployed before, but this seemed a little scary for me, a lot scary for me. And uh, Terry had peace about it right away. He was just like, this is what, like, they feel like God is really calling them. And uh, I was, like, sick to my stomach and didn't, knew I had no control over the situation. So um, I prayed, and uh, the next morning, it's just, all I can say is that supernatural peace. And uh, it's pretty amazing, and I, I can't really explain it. I can't account for it, but I honestly have not had a minute of fear or worry since then, and um, I, because I think we know that God is really working. So he's there now, and uh, he left Thursday, and his team, which is composed of people from all over the world, ex-military, special force type, 
and uh, they, we, we can already see God working. So the team had said, hey, getting across the border, we've got a guy in place, he, he goes across all the time, we'll get you there safely. Originally, Brandon thought he was going to have to take a taxi, didn't have to take the taxi. Like, flawless entry there. So, anyway, supernatural peace. So, whatever you're going through, and we're all going through stuff, um, it's really incredible to know that we're not going through it alone. And God is with us all the time. And we can rest in Him. And even when we do get scared and fearful, I don't know why I'm up here shaking and <laughs> stand in front of people all the time. But anyway, the truth is He is with us. And He holds us up when we don't have the strength to hold ourselves up. So the reading this morning is a familiar one. And we are sheep. If I can get my phone open. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. not share a few thoughts on Psalm 23 this morning, but before we go there, let's just go back to the video. How many people felt a huge compliment when they were classified as sheep this morning? That <laughs> 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 uh, is who we are. And uh, the great thing about it is that the Lord understands it. And uh, so, it, as uh, we, we saw those sheep scattering, and that is exactly what sheep do. And I, I never owned sheep, but I did work with a neighbor that had some. And uh, you try to chase them, 20 sheep, they'll go 20 different ways. <laughs> and, uh, and then the owner comes, and he calls them, and they go follow him into the pen and uh, they're all good so before we delve into Psalm 23 I'd like to just read a few passages and then we'll try to latch it all together and try to make some sense of it and uh, the first one Isaiah 53, and I'm, it's verse 5 and 6, but I'm going to actually read them uh, backwards. I'm going to read verse 6 first, and then 5. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now we'll go to John chapter 10, where Jesus tells us that he is a good shepherd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. 
But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the, the, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And the stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they which were, not the things, they which were he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and fleeth, leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catches them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. <coughs> I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and they also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And we'll flip over to John 14, just two verses. And these were verses that the Lord told his followers just before he left them. And he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all these things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. <coughs> now, as Jesus is a good shepherd, we also have shepherds in the church that are leading the flock, and they also, just a few verses out of... Uh, 1 Peter 5, and uh, the elders which we could interpret the shepherds, which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. <laughs> so now... We come back to the Psalm of David, a well-known psalm, and one that we are all ready to claim. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the first thing that has to be, he has to be our shepherd. We have to have accepted him as our Lord. 
before we can make the claims of this psalm. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David experienced shepherding the sheep. He knew what it was like to be on the mountains in the night. And he knew the peace. And as he grew and matured, he also found that uh, the Lord was with him and he gave the, the lion and the bear into his hand as he protected the sheep. And then uh, he goes on, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. As David fought the battles with the wild animals, and then later, when uh, he went to his brothers, when they were at battle with the Philistines, he had no fear of the evil one that was attacking. Because he knew that the Lord was with him. But he also realized that he was also fighting spiritual battles later in life. And that he needed the, the rod and the staff of the Lord to guide him back again. Because he too was a, one of the sheep that was going astray. And individuals had to prod him with the rod and the staff to bring him back into a relationship with the Lord that he could be restored. As he uh, he felt, we look at the the um, the rod and the staff. Their direction for us, and they will, the Lord will use them to draw us closer to Him again, and to. To take us, as David confessed time and again, when he was approached, he said, I have sinned. And the Lord said, your sin has been taken away. And that is, I believe that David already understood at that time that there was a Savior coming, the Prince of Peace, that would take the sin of the world upon him that we could all be restored and have the peace that passes understanding. And the goodness and mercy, yes, we, we are so ready to interpret that as it'll be good times, and that it will not necessarily be that, but the goodness of the Lord leadeth us to repentance. Mm -hmm. And that is where our peace comes from. Mm -hmm. And it didn't come cheap. It came at an awful time. <clears throat> the Lord, as he told us in John, he laid down his life. They didn't take it from him. He gave it voluntarily. That we could be restored and have peace that passes understanding. Amen. I believe it. Miss Steve. Thank you, Edgar. For those of you who don't know Edgar and Mary and Grace, um, I can just simply say 
you need to get to know Edgar and Mary and Grace. Um, I have come to love and appreciate them. Um, I appreciate Edgar's heart and Mary's heart and Grace's as well. I appreciate Edgar, how he understands the Father's heart mm. and, and how he models it and how he, and how he speaks it out. When we were preparing for today, and I knew about the video, I knew we were going to be focusing on this idea of shepherd. I'm like, I know he's witnessed it, I know he's been involved in it, and he understands this. And I appreciate what you shared. By the way, you took every text I was going to use. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all good, because that, that just confirms for me that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is working. As we are in week two, um, last week, we focused on the, what? Hope, on the hope of, of, that comes with waiting. Today we're focusing on peace, the peace of Christ. I want you just to where you're, right where you're seated to think about this statement. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. Just close your eyes and repeat that. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. when I meditate on that, when I think about that, there's a peace that comes. There is a peace that, as Paul says, as Edgar referenced, that passes all understanding. The peace that Lynn talks about, the peace that Terry talked about when they heard what for most parents about a son-in-law or a son going into the very war that is so it's crazy what's happening there. And yet there's this peace that guards your heart in Christ Jesus. This peace that we look at, that we think about when we gather for Christmas and we think about the wonder of his peace. Last week, Kevin talked about the verses, the, the prophecies, over 300, as high as 700, if you can really look for them, but 300 plus very plain prophecies in the Old Testament about the birth of the Messiah. One that many of us will read, and maybe it's on Christmas cards that you give out. Isaiah 9, 6 reads, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, say this with me, Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful. Mighty God, <coughs> Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This word peace is shalom. It means peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness. Prosperity, not in a bank account way, a prosperity in body, soul, and mind. Welfare and tranquility. Prince of Peace. Prince of Shalom. Friends, as we think about Advent and the peace of Christ, this peace, this shalom, is not a word. It's not just a title. It's a person. The peace of Christ. It is Jesus himself. And when we pause and think about the peace that we can have, we need to recognize and remember that this peace is a person. It's not a picture on the wall. It's not uh, a figment of our imagination or something distant. Emmanuel, God with us. God drew near to us. Prince of Peace. Luke 2 says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts, 
How many when the Ethereum's have you can hear this can hear uh, uh, min Linus and the Charlie Brown Christmas? <laughs> Every time I read this, that's the voice I hear. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those in whom his favor rests. I want us to understand we know this, but do we know this? We know this here, but has it settled in our hearts, in our very spirits, that there is a peace that we can know? His name is Jesus. That there is a peace that passes all understanding, that there is a Prince of Peace. And God, he said, and I love this, he goes, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's us. This announcement that was made that first Christmas, that, that is us. God's favor resting on us. His peace is for us. This word peace, although in the Greek, is very similar to the, what's in the Hebrew. It is similar, very similar to shalom. But in the Greek, it adds this little bit of meaning, the opposite of chaos and disorder. As we, and this is the thing that I want us to focus on, that we have peace in a person. His name is Jesus. And when he comes, when we hear his voice, if we know his voice, chaos and disorder are calmed, are replaced. It's the opposite of chaos and disorder. So many of us in our lives, when we forget who Jesus is, when we don't recognize and embrace that he is Prince of Peace, Prince of Shalom, there is chaos and disorder in our lives. It's amazing to me, and I think so many of us could, could actually speak into this, how when we hear God's voice, when we do find him as a person that is the peace, the Prince of Peace, it's not that the chaos and disorder vanish, but it's like I can walk through it because I know I'm not alone. I can walk through the chaos. I can walk through the disorder with a peace that protects my mind, my heart, my soul. And this is the peace that we focus on when we think of Christmas. A peace that is a person, Emmanuel, God with us. When God came near in the person of Jesus, our Good Shepherd, arrived. When God came near in the person of Jesus, our good shepherd arrived. Edgar shared what I'm about to go over. That we, you know, in John 10, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you Pharisees, and it's interesting, I, and I say this often, anytime we read the words of Jesus, always pay attention to who he's talking to. The religious leaders, those who were the Pharisees, I mean, we remember that they were a group of religious leaders who were trying their best to do away with Jesus because he was stealing their power. He was telling everybody that they were not to be trusted. The list goes on. He's speaking to them, but we also need to pay attention. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Here's a picture of a sheep pen from En Gedi, the desert of En Gedi in Israel. This is what Jesus is talking about. Sometimes I understand that in Bethlehem, uh, in the hills were shepherds, and there were many, and where the angels first appeared, uh, where appeared that Christmas night, that we sing about, that we read about. Sometimes they would have a cliff. Uh, I tried to find a picture and couldn't find one. But sometimes it's a cave, like they, a shepherd's pen would be a cave. 
And what they would do, they'd have this big rock that was the top, and they would dig out underneath the, the, the rock, creating a cave. They would build a wall, but with every shepherd's pen, there was a gateway. And in some cases, it was a, a cave that was dug out with a stone wall with one gate in. Most of the times, they were out in the open like this, and they would build these pens. When, it, when it, it talks in Psalm 23 about how the good shepherd prepares the way. Actually, where you can be comforted, where you can be protected, this is what they're referring to. A good shepherd goes and he, he builds this pen. And there's only one way in. And the good shepherd stands to protect in that gate. They would sit in that gate. They would never leave that gate once the sheep were in. This is in their minds when Jesus is talking. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and, he, and leads them out. And this was all, and Edgar referenced this, the video showed this, that you cannot push sheep. They have to be led. When he, has brought out all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They follow because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. We can't be too hard on the Pharisees. Because my question is, and sorry for my voice today, um, there's a couple people here that are visiting that I'd really, really love to just sit and talk with you today, but I can't. I'm trying to keep my distance from people. I tested negative, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> just trying to not spread things. Um, the Pharisees didn't understand as we watched that video, and Edgar shared it as well, how many felt the compliment that we are as dumb as sheep? Have you ever been told you're as dumb as a sheep? <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> I've been told too. <laughs> um, I'm like, how could they understand? Because for them, they were the authority. For them, they were the voice of God. How could they understand? How could even the people understand? Do we understand? Because for them, when Jesus is talking, they are used to this system. This is how God works. He speaks through us, the Pharisees would say. We are God's conduit to you. God is distant from you because you are so dirty. You are so filthy. You are so full of sin. There is a distance between you and God. How could you know his voice? How could you understand? And this is the thing that, that I want that we can't miss about Christmas. God came near. Emmanuel. God with us. The hope that comes from the waiting. The peace that comes in a person. We have access to Christ. To his voice, if we are in relationship with him. And that's the key part about this. Like as Edgar said, if Jesus isn't Lord and Savior, then you don't know his voice. The Holy Spirit who lives in us <coughs> speaks to us. Jesus, and I love how in John 14, Jesus, the first look, he says to them, Peace be with you. And by the way, when Jesus rose from the dead, and the first time he comes to the disciples, they're all huddled up, you know, like trembling in fear, as you and I would have been. What was the first word that Jesus said to them? Peace be unto you. Peace. And this shalom, this peace that is in a person. When I think about what Jesus said and what we learned about sheep, as I said, no wonder they didn't understand. 
At this moment, if we dare pause, if we dare assess ourselves, do we understand? Do we know his voice? Do we know his peace? Like sheep, we can be pretty dense, make the same mistakes over and over and over again. We can wander off course, and we need help figuring out what to do and where to go. We, call, we qualify as sheep a lot of times. And when we do, we forfeit the peace that comes. When we're not listening to his voice, we forfeit the peace that comes. And you know when sheep thrive? We've already heard. It's when they have a good shepherd. Sheep thrive when there's a shepherd that loves them like crazy. And when uh, there was a book I've read that there's going to be a quote from in a minute by uh, an individual who wrote Psalm 23 through the, the eyes of a shepherd. And he talks about how his love for these animals. He said, I understand that because you love them. There is... When the sheep trust you, when they get to know you and they know your voice, it is this connection, he said, that is different from most animals that he's ever experienced. The shepherd lives with them, he leads with them, he knows them, he calls them by name. When we were going through John 10, did you catch that? Where Jesus said, I call them by name. How does that land when you think of the Prince of Peace and the peace of Christmas, that he knows your name. He knows your name. So personal. Jesus talks about the shepherd, the shepherd, the shepherd to sheep relationship. As he continues, therefore, Jesus said again, Verily, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Remember this picture. I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Whoever enters through Christ, they will come in and out and go and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. This verse is so defining. This verse is so significant in the life and ministry of Christ because in this moment, he sets the table, brings the reality of what is actually happening in our world. That there is a death. There is a life. There is darkness. There is light. There is the kingdom of darkness. There is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of light. There are these two realities. And we cannot lose these words and, and let this state with us that our ancient enemy, his whole purpose for you, he doesn't care if you are a Christ follower or not. His whole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he cares about. And yet when we make the decision to follow Christ, to surrender our lives to him, Jesus says, I have come to give you life that you would have it to the full. There is this reality. There is these two things happening in our world constantly, every day. And Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, verse 14. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus speaks into how a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And friends, this is precisely the mission of Jesus that he was born to accomplish. He would go all the way to the cross to lay down his life to rescue us from anything that separated us and put us in danger. Anything that would lead us into this death, of, into eternal death, into eternal darkness. Our good shepherd has provided 
has made peace possible for those who find themselves lost, for those who find themselves in trouble, for those who find themselves on their own and outside of what they were created to be. We were created to be led, to be cared for, to be protected. We were created to be in a place with a good shepherd, with a God that loves us radically. Our good shepherd, the Prince of Peace, not only secures our eternity by laying down his life, our good shepherd also leads us to, to places of provision, to places of peace, to places where we know his voice and can live with him and in him and through him as we grow in faith. And I love how Jesus said in verse 3, he leads his sheep. He doesn't drive us. <laughs> we know what happens. He leads us. And when we know his voice, when we understand who, is a, who he is, we are able to trust him, the good shepherd. And once sheep trust, once they know his voice. Once they know how much he's loved, he loves them, they follow their shepherd. Because they know this person is the person who puts them in green pastures. This is the person who protects me. This is the person who guides me. This is the person who leads me beside still waters. And you know how a shepherd does that? Because you think about this, and you think about the geography, you think about where all these shepherds would actually go. There is no still water because there's brooks running everywhere. And the funny thing is, I actually watched a video of this and getting ready for this. If you, took, if you take a sheep and take them to a brook where the water's running, they look at it and run because there's too much noise. Like, it's just like they are such skittish little creatures. So what does the good shepherd do? He actually dams the creek. He makes a dam in the brook so that the water slows down and actually becomes peaceful so they can drink. And I love that imagery. The Good Shepherd leads us beside still waters, takes the torrents in our lives, and in a way that only he can things calm down, the water becomes still. Philip Keller is the guy I was talking about, an East African shepherd, with a lifetime of experience in this field, came to the realization of how important the shepherd to sheep realization really was. And he said, in a course of time, in the course of time, I came to realize that nothing so quieted and reassured the sheep as to see me in the field. The presence of their master and owner and protector put them at ease as nothing else could do. And this applied day and night. The same, true, the same is true about our relationship with Jesus as our good shepherd. His presence in our lives has the same effect on us. His followers as sheep it has the same effect on us, his followers, as sheep with the shepherd. He brings peace and confidence that it is okay to lie down and rest because he, because he is taking care of us. Because he has calmed or will calm the water. Because he will guide us and direct us in his paths. We're going to share communion. I'm going to ask uh, Claude and Terry and Randy to come and pass this out. Please. I only ask Claude, I just handpick the other two. <laughs> As the emblems are passed, I want us to recognize that as we, his followers, remember his body broken and his blood shed for us. As we remember what Jesus said when he did this with his followers and he said, a new covenant I make 
This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. For the remission of sin. And when we take these, we remember, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, we not only remember what Jesus did, we remember that he's coming. And so we wait with hope. But it can't be lost on us that the only reason that we can have peace, the only reason that we can know the Good Shepherd, is because of what he did at Calvary. Perhaps, perhaps this is what Jesus, your Good Shepherd, wants to remind you about most of all this Christmas. He is present with you. He is near you. He is the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm.